It is very difficult to discuss school desegregation through the framework of critical race theory without first discussing the history that led up to this point. Through my research of the history of school segregation, integration, and racism in general in the U.S. society as a whole, I believe that to truly desegregate schools, we first need to figuratively and literally desegregate the rest of society first. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, critical race theory, or CRT, is the view that law and legal institutions are inherently racist and that race itself instead of being biologically grounded and natural, is a, is a socially constructed concept that is used by white people to further their economic and political interests at the expense of people of color. According to critical race theory, CRT, racial inequality emerges from the social, economic, and legal differences that white people create between races to maintain elite white interests in labor markets and politics, giving rise to poverty and criminality in many minority communities." End quote. So because our school system does not exist in a vacuum, it is one cog in our societal machine, and because schools are a microcosm of our community, reflecting the traditions, culture, and customs, both good and bad, of our country, just at a smaller level. From the beginnings of this country, white people expropriated land that wasn't theirs, stole people as if they were property to take, and thus seized power to reign over everything and everyone they saw fit. Once they had established this position of power in society, or white supremacy, the white leaders at the top of this corrupt society would continue to clench desperately to this power for years to come, leading up to today, in 2020, since, since which there have been shifts, some progress, but the structure of the country's society is the same. Racial capitalism, as Pierce and Dubois describe it, is the structure that needs overturning. Pierce says that racial capitalism encompasses the view that racial ideologies and the social structures emergent from capitalism mutually constitute one another. In particular, Dubois's racial capitalist analysis of the United States shows that slavery and capitalism are not independent or hierarchical. hierarchical to each other, but rather co-articulating systems of power integral to the economic and political development of the United States. That's from Pierce, page 278. Another way to think of this is that a house has been repainted a few times, some rooms renovated, but the foundation and infrastructure, or racial capitalism in this case, of the home is untouched. To have a just society, one that is equal for all people despite the color of their skin or the country their ancestors came from, we need to tear down the house and rebuild completely. It is improbable to think this would happen all at once, but more likely the house would be rebuilt room by room until this completely different house than the original. The foundation was poured. When the 13th Amendment was passed, slavery was legally ended, but oppression lived on in the form of indentured servants' black codes. The Jim Crow laws were the framing infrastructure that would hold up the house, give the house its shape, and become its bones for years to come. The insulation was there to protect this race dynamic. It was made up of ex-Confederates in positions of power, such as judges, lawyers, teachers, policemen, and politicians. Klansmen held positions in strategic places of influence within the community. The drywall sealed in the insulation when white people fled to the suburbs and enrolled their children in segregation academies instead of integrating with black students. The flooring and countertops were laid as the imbalance of funds had already begun. The General Education Board gave only $2.4 million to black schools compared to $25 million to white schools before integration even began. The finishing touches were put on with a fresh coat of paint and a picket fence because until 1972, Hispanics were considered legally white. So on paper, integration was working, even if his school was made up of only black and Hispanic students, leaving predominantly white schools untouched and unbothered. It is important to remember that the house has been altered and renovated through efforts from the black community to achieve positive changes and progress.
for equality. Examples of these are Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, Ruby Bridges attending an all-white school at the young age of six, the Little Rock Nine in 1957, the Civil Rights Act in 1964, the extensive civil rights work of Martin Luther King Jr., the social programs and police monitoring by the Black Panthers, and so many more. But there is so much more work to be done on this house. In 2020, because the structure of our schooling system and country as a whole is the same, segregation is still just as prevalent, if not worse. The tactic of tracking, the basic, uh, the practice of placing students of similar ability together overrepresents black students in lower classes and white students in AP classes. Extracurricular activities and lunch tables are still segregated in the few schools with varied races. White flight still exists. White families often send their children to private schools or move to suburbs to avoid majority black schools. Property taxes in a district dis dictate how much funding that school will receive, causing huge differences in resources for black and white schools and students. Instead of new paint, a new roof, or rewiring the electric, the entire infrastructure needs to be ripped down and built from scratch to see real change. This most likely will not happen all at once by overthrowing the government, tearing down racial capitalism, but it is more likely to happen room by room, board by board, until the original house is non-existent and there's a new one in its place. No tangible change can be accomplished without a mass change of mindset first. There has been extensive work done to weave together this racial capitalist society using the threads of an us and them mentality. It is the glue keeping such a corrupt system intact. Our current president is a master of racial divisiveness. The Black Lives Matter movement, however, is an example of an effort to change the narrative of our society and to place real value on black human beings. Schools will continue to be segregated until equality in other facets of society is achieved to the tipping point. For instance, financial equity will allow for neighborhoods to become less segregated and create more choice for schools for black families. White people need to be fighting alongside people of color to make these changes happen instead of thinking of it as a black person's problem. It's impossible to talk about school desegregation yet without first talking about society's desegregation first. So what do we do until this corrupt infrastructure has been rebuilt? As educators, we have a very special responsibility and opportunity. It's important for us to teach all of our students the truth about history, not just what's in the textbooks that we're given, and to empower and inspire those young students to become activists and to fight for what is right throughout their lives. As educators and decent human beings, it's our responsibility as well to educate ourselves about racism and about our own racist tendencies so we don't perpetuate these inequalities in our own classroom. Speak up when injustices are seen within your school and make sure to make space for people of color at all levels. This includes students. And most importantly, listen to our fellow staff members who are not white, to students of color, because we have a lot to learn and they have a lot to teach us.